put more power in who you are over what you are. I call it who over what. And it's not, it's not reinventing the wheel. We've been doing this for 5,000 years, the Stoic philosophers, and I just kind of fell on it, fell into Stoicism from that. But um, the Stoics call them vices and uh, virtues. Uh, I think in today's society, people care what they are more than who they are. And a lot of my philosophy is describing the difference of both. So who you are is internal traits. Like I really value being a hard worker, being a good friend, being a protector and kind of being funny because I needed some attention. And I didn't take, I didn't put any identity on being the bully kid, the kid who talked funny, the kid who girls made fun of, and didn't really touch me on a deep enough level to care that I was that kid. So I can move on from, from being that kid. That's what I was, that wasn't who I was. You're listening to the Born Primitive Podcast. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Born Primitive Podcast. How we doing, Big Tone? Morning, Bear. Doing well. Good, good, man. It's the best time of year right now. Sunshine, I agree. beach days. You been able to get out of the beach at all? Oh, yeah. Nice. Until I, hey, once it creeps up past 90, though, then it's no, no more. <laughs> no more. If it would just stay 78, that would be, that'd be ideal. Yeah, we get that for like two weeks in Virginia I know. Beach, and then it's, then it's 100. Uh, but, hey, we're really excited for today's guest, uh, Kevin Cassidy author, entrepreneur, and Hollywood stuntman. Um, he's worked on movies like The Dark Knight Rises, The Other Guys, and many Marvel movies. He also starred in Ninja Nation and wrote his memoir, Falling Down to Find Myself. So, Kevin, welcome to the Born Primitive Podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So I think I want to start, Kevin. You know, you wrote a memoir because um, I think this will probably shed light on other topics we can get into. So could could you... Walk us through um, what inspired the memoir and, and for the audience. Um, give us a summary of, of your backstory. Uh, well, what motivated it was a little bit of COVID, but I was a teacher for a little bit. I've always kind of been pulled to mentor kids and help kids out and coach and kind of that's a little bit been my passion. So I was writing different speeches, like talking to high schools, talking to colleges, talking to kids, and every kind of talk I wrote became three talks, four talks, five talks, one for corporate, one for high school, one for college, and then a different story to articulate different you know, methodologies or philosophies I had. And then when COVID hit and I wasn't doing movies, I uh, kept writing, kept writing. And at one point I'm like, I'm halfway with a book at this point. Once I write the whole story and get it done with, uh, pick a target audience so that way I can pick from the book and take it to different places I want to speak to. So the book was more motivated by me wanting to you know, get my story out and my philosophy and my methodology out to the world. Um, but short, long story short, which I'm terrible at, uh, I was born with a, a facial dirt birth defect called a cleft palate. I had, um, there's a big bubble around my nose. I had no roof in my mouth, no nose, no teeth, no nothing. I had over seven major surgeries before I got out of high school, learned how to talk, speech therapy. Uh, I still really have to concentrate on, on speaking and, and, uh, articulating well and slowing down. It's a very conscious thing for me. Uh, I look a lot better now, but um, going through elementary school, junior high and high school, I had either no 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 bone in my nose or no teeth or well, switch down face, all the, all the things that would get you kind of bullied and picked on. And I got bused to a pretty rough school, ended up being a pretty good athlete, so that kind of added to it. Um, it was a little bit of a don't bat down, fight everybody mentality for a while, which helped me kind of mature through uh, a little earlier than some of my peers did. So by the time I got to high school, I was pretty, pretty moderate, pretty even kill, and not all I was getting to me, I could focus on my athletics and other things. Uh, played minor league baseball for a year, um, then became a teacher in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, taught and lived in inner city, loved it, was passionate about it, had the energy, had the mentality to go in there and hoop for the kids and you know, try to really touch them on their level and and, uh, and be an effective leader in that, in that world. And then randomly, I went to a, a tryout for a sport called slam ball, like full contact basketball and trampolines. It was, we used to have a beer and watch it at night when I was teaching and man, that'd be awesome. And I, they emailed me, hey, we're doing a tryout in Philly, come up for a tryout, looking for extra pro athletes in the area. I play very minor, low level minor league baseball, but I got on their list. My buddy kind of drove up there to goof I uh, went to Temple to try it out. I made it. They shipped me to LA. I make it again. I'm on TV doing a slam ball. 
was a defensive player of the year in the sport. Just was free ride in LA, was broke, living on couches, got a free ride to live in LA for three months and do this stupid sport. It was awesome. A uh, guy met there, the stunt man. He got me a tryout with a movie called The Longest Shard. Uh, so went to a tryout, made this movie, became a stunt football player in this movie, made more money than ever made in my life. So it was like, I'll ride this wave until I get a real job and go back to teaching or coaching. And 17, 18 years later, I'm looking for an escape out of it. So it was just monopolizing my time, my schedule. I have a wife and kids. I was over in uh, Europe, London and Prague for four months doing Spider-Man Far From Home. I came home one weekend for my daughter's second birthday, flew right back to London for work. I'm like, it's either marriage to the game or be a dad. And I'm very passionate about being a good good father. So hung up a cleat for Hollywood, open the business, throw the book, do podcasts, and I uh, try to live a little, little balanced life. It also helps that my wife makes good money, so I had a little bit of a uh, – Oh, easy escape for transitioning from careers. So that's a long story short. Well, that's super cool. And I, I'm, I'm a dark Knight fan. So I, I, yeah. I kind of want to just ask right off the bat specifically about that. Like what, how was that experience? I mean, obviously that, that little franchise blew up. I think it was what three films. Um, so uh, what, what was your role in that? And, and what was that experience? Cause I, that, the dark Knight rises. Was that the last of the three? That was the middle one. Oh, oh, that's the middle one. Okay. Yeah. So Batman Begins, Dark Knight, and Dark... No, it was the last one, and Dark Knight Rises. So. Yeah. So by then, obviously, you guys knew it was this major blockbuster success. So was it really cool to be a part of that set? And and what specifically were you doing? And maybe we can... Yeah, I can remember some scenes. Like, maybe that was actually you doing it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, walk yeah. us through that. So it was... Uh, Halo was very intricate, random layers. That once you get into it, you can talk for days about how, how it's organized, how you get in, and you build your reputation. There's no agents, no managers... You just have to build your reputation and get hired. And I started doing football movies, The Longest Shard, Grid Iron Gang, Invincible, Mark Wahlberg. So I was a pretty good football player. I could, you know, do that stuff. As I was doing that, I was training how to do fights and falls and fire, drive cars, be all around stuntman. So I was getting all the football calls and starting to build bridge that, you know, build that bridge to get to the, the big, big legit fights, cars, all that stuff. So I was just on that establishing myself as a legit stunt guy and I get a call to do the dark night. I'm like, Oh man, heck yeah, it's big for me. I'm like we have a football scene in the dark night rises. So I'm like, all right, oh, I'm in. So it's a scene when the football field blew up. Yeah. And uh, so I was one of the guys, um, the stunt guys and I get blown up in the football field. And it was, it was an unreal experience working with like Christopher Nolan. We were in Pittsburgh on the, on the stadium, Ben Roethlisberger, all the players are there. If you remember that, did the national anthem and have all that. So they're they're all there. They build up this platform on the on the field and they put holes down into it. And we had to run and then fall into these holes as we got blown up. And uh, they told me the real Heinz Ward, NFL you know, pro baller Heinz Ward, is literally running by the kickoff. And uh, they're like, Kevin, yeah, you're the most experienced football guy here, so you have to get faked out and turn <laughs> around and catch and then catch Heinz Ward at the goal line. <laughs> All right, everybody ready? I'm like, oh, I if I could catch him, I wouldn't be here right now. I can't catch that board. And then dodge these things and jump in the hole. And so it was, it was I kind of, I, I literally messed up that scene three or four times. That almost cost him a lot of money. Uh, but we, we got it done. <laughs> and then when you get, when you do a, a movie like that, does that make it much easier to get bigger gigs? Because like, it's, it's almost like you, if you were associated with a major successful franchise like that, it's on your Rolodex now, and then you know you, you get more calls. For sure, and the people who are running that movie know the people who are running the Marvel movies, and know the people who are running the other movies, and uh, they know the guys like the movie Invincible or even the Longest Show. My first movie, there's a legit stunt coordinator uh, who did all the fight scenes, the car driving stuff in that movie. He was plugged into a different network of stunts as opposed to the football sports network. So all these guys know each other. So you do a good job for that guy. And then he'll refer you to another guy or I'll call this guy and say, Hey, I heard you got a job. Like I was the main stunt guy in uh, Ant-Man, uh, the bad guy, the yellow jacket character, the first Ant-Man, everything the super villain suit was me. Uh, so I call that guy and say, Hey, I'm pretty good double for this guy. I got the skill set. He goes, Oh yeah, you, you, I, I think I know you haven't met you on this set. You were friends with this guy. You worked up with this guy in this movie. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he calls his buddy. who's probably the guy from dark Knight or one of his movies. I'm like, Oh, that guy was awesome. Definitely hire that guy. So the, the networks kind of get bigger. So networking with like the mailroom guys and networking with the CEO guys and 
they all share, you know, people. Kevin, how did how did being in this industry change your perspective on movies? Because I, I can assume like you try to edit one shitty video that you film on your cell phone and you're like, this is to make a, a, a film is such a magical undertaking. But did it did it change it in a positive way for you being behind the scenes and seeing how it unfolds? Or would you say now you watch a movie and you're constantly dissecting all of the things that are happening in the background? A little bit of both. If the movie's good enough, I can dumb myself down and get on board. If the movie's not good enough, I'll be breaking it down. And this is still, I can't watch it anymore. My wife's like, why Why do you hate this movie? I'm like, you don't want to know why I hate this movie. I don't like it. They messed up so many things. But they make me appreciate. I, I'm more, I dissect things. I think things. I, I go through, you know, I train the thought practices. And so it's really cool for me to see all the intricacies and layers and how the departments work together to build this one 10 second shot that took a week or two to make and it made me appreciate all the uh all the wrangling of departments and, and logistics it takes to do what looks pretty simple on on the screen when i can imagine and i'd love to hear your thoughts on it that like even just the director like seeing a true like you mentioned chris nolan like seeing a real visionary who's at the top of that field versus maybe a mid-level film film that has way less money. Was that something that, that you found interesting kind of seeing the levels as within any human like system, there's going to be levels to, to skill and kind of expertise. Was that something that was fascinating to watch? Yeah, that was but even more than that, I think was the, the producer. So like when they did the first Ant-Man, um, Edgar Wright wrote and directed, it was his baby. And the producers from Marvel said, no, we don't like your script. We're making this movie. So that's not my movie. I don't want to direct it. We'll direct our movie or buy. And he went, cool, buy, left. And it took him a long time to find a director who was going to direct their movie. So this guy maybe have been brilliant, but he was told to just shoot what they want to be shot. And then other guys like Christopher Nolan have just such a, they see the whole movie in their head before it's even shot. And they're five steps ahead of everybody, which is great, but it's hard to trickle down. Because he's like, oh, in two weeks we have to do this. So this must be right right now. Like we don't even have the people here that are going to be here in two weeks. Right? Like you're, you know, come down, come to today for a minute, right? <laughs> um, but it's really interesting to see the politics of how what directors are able to have that creative license, and which ones are kind of wrangled back on different movie sets and the pros and cons of each, which is pretty interesting for me. Yeah, that I, I can imagine that's fascinating, especially a true visionary trying, like you said, trying to reel them back into the day to day. Um, Kevin, yeah. you kicked off with something that you said as during COVID, you kind of found yourself writing more and more and kind of write, getting your philosophy down on paper. I would love to kind of dissect a little w what your philosophy is and kind of how you landed on it. Was there, I know you talked about having the, the cleft palate as a, a, when you were born and kind of working through that is a lot of your philosophy sh or philosophy shaped around kind of your experience, I would assume. And, and, and can you kind of unfold there or unpack that for us? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely based on my experience, but you're ignorant when you're in it. You can't see the forest through the trees. Now, looking back on my life, of people ask me all the time when they, oh, here's a picture of me when I was born, uh, no face, and here's me at Burt Reynolds in Hollywood. Well, how, how the hell did that happen? Um, and, why, and I, even the friends I knew growing up, like I was a pretty happy kid. I was hard nosed, but pretty happy. Like, how can you be happy when you're getting bullied and beaten up? And I said, like, I don't know. I mean, I'm too dumb not to be happy. I mean, there's, so looking back on my, my mother always said, if you're going to be stupid, you better be tough. So I kind of nailed both of <laughs> us. Uh, uh, so looking back on my life, um, digging into that, like, what, why was I happy? Why was I able to do this? What were my outlets? What were, maybe I can find something in there that could help other kids. And maybe not. Maybe it's just something I, I would never be able to articulate. But I dove into it and I had some light bulbs go off. And the, the main core of the philosophy is, uh, putting more power in who you are over what you are. I call it who over what. And it's not it's not reinventing the wheel. We've been doing this for 5,000 years, Stoic philosophers, and I just kind of fell on it, fell into Stoicism from that. But um, the Stoics call them vices and uh, virtues. Uh, I think in today's society, people care what they are more than who they are. And a lot of my philosophy is describing the difference of both. So who you are is internal traits. So like I really value being a hard worker, being a good friend, being a protector, and kind of being funny because I needed some attention. And I didn't take, I didn't put any identity on being the bully kid, the kid who talked funny, the kid who girls made fun of, and didn't really touch me on a deep enough level to care that I was that kid. 
so I can move on from, from being that kid. That's what I was. That wasn't who I was. And for me, I was pretty lucky in that world because I didn't have a choice. I couldn't change what I was. I didn't have a face. I didn't have a nose. I couldn't talk. There, I did speech therapy. I tried to improve those things, but I was there's no change in that. So you better focus on something that can make you happy or just live in a, in a box and be miserable your whole life. So I was forced to do that like from birth. So it's always kind of been my my how to is I don't really care what I am externally. I really focus and take pride in who I am internally. And that's carried me through Hollywood. And then it let me leave Hollywood too. I was a Hollywood stuntman, hang out with stars, make a lot of money, travel in the world. Um, but that still wasn't who I was. That was what I was, what I did. So I was able to walk away from that with no with no ego, no just it was pretty easy for me to transition. And a lot of people go through transitions, whether it's single mom or um, lose a child. Or Everyone goes through a transition at some point. And if you're tied to what you are more than who you are, you're going to have a hard fall. And you're going to hopefully learn that lesson at some point. I learned it very early. And that's kind of the core of my philosophy, who over what. If I articulate yes. that well enough. Yeah, you did. And, and what bubbles up for me is because I call a young nerd is that like it, it's you're almost like the wounded healer archetype, meaning like you at a young age had something that some people would consider like a severe crisis that maybe for most people doesn't happen until their 20s, 30s, like you said, maybe a single mom, a divorce, uh, they get fired from their job, even something like that. Whereas you, you kind of had to go through that dark night of the soul at a young age. And what that does, like, and, and those are my favorite people in my life too, is like, you can see it in somebody's eyes when they go through that, because you can't fake that. And when you come out the other side, you usually have the wisdom then to hold other people's hand through it. And that's like, that's the wounded he healer archetype is that if you weren't wounded in the first place, you would never have the wisdom you have today. But as you probably know, it takes a level of kind of self-awareness and like reflection of the ego to end up at that spot because you can stay trapped in that kind of wounded. And we actually, we just did a podcast um, where we discussed this is that like, you can almost start to identify with that wounded or like victim mentality. And then, you, then you're not transcending it. Then you're staying through that over time and you'll build a, a, a litany of reasons as to why you're there. And that's like, we all rationalize as humans. That's a very natural thing, but eventually you kind of have to grow and, and, and mature out of that. So yeah, love hearing your story. Cause it sounds like, whereas most people, even myself, I, I, my, I was 16 and started having some like insane life events that kind of thrust me into a past that, or a, a path that made me start to self-reflect. You almost had it at birth, which is like, it, you look at it and is insanely difficult, but then if you're able to make through it almost, it almost widens your bandwidth of, of what you're able to deal with. Yeah, exactly. Right. And like articulating that to different people at different ages is, is, is hard. Um, and I like to say that you can be in love with what you are. Like you say, following that victim mentality, I love being a victim. So I am now identifying as my what, any what. It could be, I love being a CEO. I love being a quarterback of the Ravens. I love all those are what. I love being a victim. Any what, throw it out the window, be, you know, put more power at any into who you are and don't care about what you are so much. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Again, not reinventing the wheel. It's been going for. Uh, of yes, and and we've had. Uh, that's what's cool though is that you see a thread between people that who have done that digging where everyone has their own flavor as to how they describe it. But like I said, you almost can't describe it if you haven't been through it. But then you you converse with enough people who um who who have kind of been through some type of uh, kind of alchemization like that, and they're able to describe it in a way that there, there's a thread through all of them. Um, did you have any moments on your journey where you felt like it, it was dark, like it got dark for you? Because I know you kept saying like, no, I'm a pretty, I was a pretty happy person. I'm a pretty, but what I've usually found is that there are some moments that are kind of the the most challenging moments. What, what would you say those were for you, especially having been kind of bullied as a, as a kid? Yeah, probably a lot of my middle school days where you're going through the adolescence anyway, you're starting to like girls and people, the, the big kids are beating up the little kids. That's where bullying kind of like peaks, I think. And you're, internally, you're dealing with hormones, a lot of other things on top of what, you know, things I was dealing with. Uh, there are times in, in those days where it was kind of like a, a, a lot of carpet being pulled out from me because I would be on a football team and baseball team, and have good friends to hang out. And then the next day, they would make fun of me and using me to up their status with a girl they liked and embarrass me in front of people. I'm like, oh, I thought we we're friends. Uh, and that sucks. Uh, so kind of learning that landscape would put me it got pretty dark there for a little bit, which made me reflect internally more and write a little bit more, watch a little bit more, be more observant of who's actually a good person. And even looking back at my philosophy now, 
who at that age cared about who they are, what they are, like who had the high ego, the high, um, the high confidence or who are humble, who weren't. So uh, that helped me the darker, more depressed I got, the more I just kept quiet and observed. And I learned a lot in that observation of dark times that I used later on. But um, and then when I was in college, I got wrongfully arrested, thrown in jail, uh, was facing like 25 years of life or something I didn't do. For two weeks, I was in jail, the door shut, like you're not getting out. I'm like, I don't know what happened. Um, so I was in jail for two weeks thinking I'm never getting out of jail. I was a pro baseball prospect, all life was ahead of me, everything's looking up, bam, overnight, you just, you're stuck. And the first couple of days, I'm like, ah, this is not real, this is fine. Three or four days later, they're like, shit, this is not my new life, I guess, so what am I gonna do in here? So it got dark in there for a little bit, but luckily it only lasted two weeks, I got out, they dropped the charges, and I was fine. I got kicked out of college, I lost my scholarship because of the bad press, but that's another whole uh, part of it. But there were a couple of times I was in that jail cell, like, Man, I kind of just got over this hump. Bam. Uh, you really do a lot of soul searching. And luckily I had those things from my youth that like just that dark look inside, you know, observe a little bit, have, you know, a little faith in that whoever what. I'm still a good guy, I'm still tough, I can hold my own in here. Maybe I can help some people in here. Um, but again, I was only there for two weeks, so it's easy to say I was I got through it. If I was there for two years, I might have went down a different rabbit hole. Who knows? Not to to the extent you're comfortable, but like what uh yeah, no, gonna, what was the circumstances of that? Again, if this is like you don't want to talk about it, but like no, no, it's in the book. That's, yeah. that, that's crazy. Can can you uh, go into more detail? Yeah, I um well when you're on I was a, a scholarship baseball player and when you go on scholarship you can't have a job. But we need money. So uh clean tables at a local bar in a small town in South Carolina. Cleaning tables, fight breaks out in the parking lot. I run out in the parking lot with the owner. Good little red net brawl breaking out. Some older guys, a couple guys in the baseball team. We start breaking it up. I get tossed around a little bit. Cops finally show up. I'm like, thank God. They handcuff everyone. It's threat, you know, they get everyone separated. And the owner's like, okay, come with me. This guy's fine. This guy's fine. And you know, no, not this guy. And he's pointing at me. I'm like, I just walked out here like two minutes ago. And uh, they're like, no, this one's going to jail. And I said, don't worry. My family are police officers from New York. I said, they're doing their job. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. I'm not taking them to jail. A couple other guys in the hole and cell. Everyone gets released, released, released. And I'm still there. I'm like, all right. I get put in front of the judge a day or two later. And the judge goes, your charges are assault and battery with attempt to kill on a police officer. You're facing 25 to life. You have five to seven years before a trial comes up. You're going to be in county for five to seven years. Uh, here's your yellow of your orange outfit and see you later. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I'm pretty sure I got the wrong guy. I have my staff shirt on still. Like, what are you doing? And he goes, this is not the time to argue, sir. I'm just telling you what your charges are and uh, see you later. So I was shipped off the county. I haven't talked to anybody. A week goes by. I haven't talked to anybody outside. I just shut the door. I'm like, someone's got to be out there figuring this out. Uh, long story short, my uncle comes down from New York. He was a cop. We get a lawyer. I was doing my student teaching at the time in college, and a woman I was doing my student teaching with, her classroom, she came every day to the jail to try to get me out, talk to somebody, like, what's happening? The articles in the paper were, you know, this guy trying to kill a cop, and I was like, I, I didn't know any of this at this point. And um, long story short, a guy who it was in, in February, so there's a couple undercover cops in this mix up, and he had a holster a uh, shoulder strap holster and it ripped in a fight. And he didn't want to pay the $35 to fix his holster. He said, the big guy ripped my holster. He went for my gun. Wow. I was the biggest guy there. So big guy, that guy did it. And he got me with every charge under the book. And I got out because a lot of his cases got flagged. He got arrested for domestic abuse and he was kind of on like naughty police guy list. And then they're like, oh, this case has a lot of People fight for him. He's, we might want to get this one, get ahead of this one, let this guy out. So they expunged my charges and uh, let me out. I'm like, sorry. Uh, but I had to uh, sign an affidavit saying I won't sue for defamation of character, but they wouldn't let me out. My uncle's like, just sign it, get the hell out on the other side, we'll figure it out. Uh, then the school I was going to, they kicked me off. I lost my scholarship because of the bad press or some papers, and, um, just a, a random. And it's something I've said a hundred times to people 
If that happened today, I walk out of here and I said, I'm going to jump in and help my friends again. I wasn't throwing punches. I, wasn't, I was pulling people off. Like, I can't not see my friend turning blue if he's getting chucked out and just be like, I hope someone helps him. And I'm, not, I'm not built that way. So I don't regret any of my actions that day. So it just sucks. It is what it is. But you no, know, it's not something that would change. Holy cow. So that, that guy, to avoid professional embarrassment, pinned it on you because he shouldn't have been in that fight and his whatever happened with his holster shouldn't i mean that's super embarrassing for a job like that you have like a serialized item with your pistol or whatever you know what i mean so i can't believe i mean that yeah. guy just must be a complete asshole for because he he sure he knew what he was doing he knew what was going to come on you for that but he'd rather rather than take the professional heat uh just put a guy potentially in, i mean that's totally insane um but hopefully yeah. i mean one of those things, man, you know, while that was obviously a horrible scenario, things like that probably give you perspective that the only way you obtain that kind of perspective is through experiences like that, right? So it's almost like the price you pay that, you know, the normal Joe Schmo can't ever have. So hopefully you're able to find the silver lining from that. It sucks, obviously, the school pulled your scholarship. So did you go right into minor league ball then from there? Uh, or what was the next, what was your next pl uh, move? Like you probably were a man without a plan there for a second. I was a man with no plan for sure. Uh, I thought it was over. I'll go to community college or something, graduate or live back home. I played in a pretty high level summer league. It's called Wooden Bat League. And I played in the same team every summer with a bunch of guys who get drafted every year. And that coach just loved me. He goes, I guess you don't worry about it. I know who you are. I'll, I'll vouch for you. So we got me a scholarship at a really small uh, NIA school down in Georgia where I went, graduated, went to the NIA World Series. It was a pretty cool experience. And then I went uh, played minor league ball after that for a year. By that point, I was kind of like on the naughty kid list. I was old, I was drafted super late. Unless I just woke up and hit 50 bombs, it wasn't going to happen. I kind of missed my window to mature in it. And what was another good thing about that was I played with some of the guys that played in the minors. They would come back and train with us or hang out. And they were, I'm hitting 350, I'm getting benched by some high school kid. Oh, it's a business, man. The Reds don't need that. They need this. So, you know, I mean, try to knew the the nightmare of what the minor leagues could be if you're a bubble guy. So I lived there for a year, lived in the Greyhound bus. I'm like, I got invited back. I'm like, no, I'm going to start my life. I, I know what she done, I appreciate it. So I was able to adjust from that better because of my being older into that world. When I was younger, I'd be like, no, I'm getting up. And some guys stay there till they're 35. And you now all they can do the rest of their life is be a baseball coach. Um, which is fine. I mean, it's not terrible, but it really hamstrings your options, which I didn't want to have happen. Yeah, minor. I, so, <laughs> Kevin, I played baseball at West Virginia University, um, uh -huh. and actually out of high school, could have signed, um, but decided to go to decided to play college ball, and then battled a bunch of had a back surgery and was was burnt out by the time I was done. But I that the minor league lifestyle, man, I tell people all the time because I have. I mean, I have four friends that are in the majors that played at West Virginia, but then probably f I think we had 22 get drafted in my time there. So a bunch that are still in the minors and that lifestyle, man, like that's that's like you said, the who or the what like that. Uh, sometimes you over identify with being an athlete and you got to rip the bandaid off because they're making 40 grand a year riding buses everywhere. Their high school, their high school facilities are better than the facilities they're using in, in minor league baseball. So yeah, that, that, that lifestyle can be a bit of a grind. Well, and there's, there's so much risk with just like making that choice to like, all right, I'm going to burn off maybe eight years of my life on <laughs> yeah. the off chance that I get called up to the big leagues. Um, and then like, but there's like, there's no cert. I mean, it's crazy, man. Yeah. Um, it, what, did you guys see the story of that pitcher that just, had his first start, like, it was a few weeks ago, but he's had, like, injury after injury after injury. He's, like, been in the minors for, like, I don't know, 10-plus years. Did you guys, did you guys catch that? I didn't see it. What organization I, is that? I, I can't remember. Uh, no, I, Skeens, I, Skeens, he's, I mean, he's young. I think he came in and, like, he did really well, and then he was super emotional in the dugout because, like, he just had, like, the worst string of luck. Like, he was talented, yeah. but, like, you know, I, I, you know yeah, I, it was, like, on Instagram, but um, I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of those stories, but... I mean, there, oh, there's very few of those stories that 99% of them don't end like that, right? It ends in, oh, shoot, I just burned 10 years of my life, and now I have to figure out what my next move is. Um, but uh, damn. Well, I think maybe you were a wise man then for kind of reading the tea leaves and realizing, okay, maybe playing like single A ball on the bubble um, is not the right career path for you and you know, being realistic enough to say, all right, I, I had my run, but let's, uh, let's close this chapter out and move on to the next one. Yeah, I think I was lucky for going through what I went through as a kid to have that mentality established before I got there. So, I mean, that's helped me, helped me in jail, helped me in the minor, helped me leave Hollywood. It's helped me 
uh, being a deformed bully kid is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and that's so from a timing standpoint, is this right around when you saw the slam ball tryouts in Philly? Uh, so after that, I became a teacher in Baltimore. Okay. So like a year later, I okay. saw the, the season of the slam ball and I played the second season. I mean, it's, it's so crazy because think about it. Like what a fluke thing. Right. And it's like life is this chain reaction of events that if like one thing doesn't happen, A or B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, don't happen. So had you not randomly seen that slam ball tryout and not a, with a buddy on a whim, hey, let's go try it. And then you got to L.A. and you do well and then someone signs you up for a stunt gig because you know how to tackle someone or whatever. Like what a what a wild chain of events that led you to then being like a, a big time stunt guy like in Hollywood for many years. Like that's just when you, th I mean, everyone probably that their life boils down to that at some point, but it can kind of make you crazy if you think about, you know, the what ifs along that journey. If something had done, to you know, had you just not seen that slam ball tryout, your your life probably, I think we could say, would be completely different. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, and that, I think when you're young, a lot of people say this, take your risk. Go, I was always been confident. I'll figure it out. I'll make money if I have to. I'll coach kids. I'll teach. I'll, I can live in a crappy apartment and be pretty happy. I don't need a whole lot. So let's go to LA for free. Who cares? Like I was, I have an older brother who is not as, he's more risk averse and yeah, I go to college, get a job, but he wouldn't have been happy putting his neck out like that. And I wouldn't have been happy being safe. So you got to kind of know who you are. And I think that's opened a lot of doors for me. Just being confident that I'll figure it out. If this doesn't work, I'll figure something else out. And then you're always constantly building your network of friends and your friends become your professional acquaintances. If you're an entrepreneur or podcast or a writer or a stuntman or a business owner, like everywhere you go, you're networking. So I have people all around the country from every different random job, movies and sports and uh, teaching uh, people I know. I can go, you know, hundred miles without, you know, being able to call up somebody and hang out with them, which is, which is the kind of life I, I really appreciate that I have. Kevin, what were the biggest surprises as you kind of established some momentum within the stunt industry as, as two people, I'm, I'm assuming bear probably knows about as much as I do about the industry. Like what were, what were the biggest surprises to you? Cause like on the outside, when you see some YouTube videos or whatnot, like it seems risky, but when you're actually in the industry, what are some, what are, what were some big surprises for you? And then for people that don't know anything about the industry, what do you think would be kind of, uh, entertaining to, to give us the inside scoop on? So a big surprise for me was like you play ball. Like I go to a tryout, I, I hit run, I keep my mouth shut, I'll make the team because I'm good. I don't have to talk, I just go play. So that was my mentality with stunts. Like I'll train, I'll show these guys I'm really good and fun on the ring. <laughs> you got to sell yourself, you got to get your own headshots, you got to build your own business, you got to talk yourself up. So I had a slower path because. I wasn't good at that. I didn't like that. It wasn't comfortable in that world. There were jobs where a guy called me, hey, can you put this werewolf and run through the woods and tackle this guy and like, be big, athletic, and scary? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of my, my MO. It's a perfect job for me. Yeah, I can do that. Turns out I don't get the job. And the guy who got it, I know, he's a terrible athlete. He can barely run and jump over and chew gum at the same time. But I found out later that he got that call. Goes, hey, I'm the best guy for the job. Absolutely. I've done this before. I played the wearable. He got the whole sales trap down and, and he got the job. You know, looking back, that coordinator goes, I can't believe I didn't hire you for that 10 years ago. I'm like, it's kind of my fault, I guess. I can't blame you. So that little game of selling yourself, you're, you are the CEO of your business. You are the product of your company and you're the marketing guy. You are. So that whole world of stunts which is great. It exists in a bubble outside of Hollywood. There's no agents, no managers, no really audition, a separate some football movies in there. So you have to build your own network and train and be entrepreneurial to even get in the door. No matter how good you are, you got to keep showing up. You're going to keep seeing people who are way worse than you get jobs over and over again. And you're like, what the hell do I have to do? But just keep showing up, keep grinding. And then, you know, I'd like to say, I'll build a career. I don't want the job, I want a career. I have friends who will lie about what they could do they get the job and do a half-assed job with it and that kind of rivals them again. I'm like, I'd rather under-promise and over-deliver and i will keep me on the trajectory. So I kind of had, that was surprising. That's how that game worked. That was a very big learning curve for me. But there was a stuntman softball league and I'd go play there. I'm playing shortstop. I'm like, I'm better than all these people. That guy's a, <laughs> well, that guy's a pro rodeo cowboy. That guy's a wushu gold medalist. That guy's a Red Bull skydiver. Yeah, they suck at softball, but holy shit, can they do other things? Phenomenal. Um, so it was uh, humbling and, uh, 
and learn experience of how, how that works. Now, the other part is the, uh, just the intricacies of what we kind of dial in. Like the guys in the seventies and eighties, the guys who hired me, who kind of stuff, none of them walk right. They're all beat the hell up. They're all old cowboys, motocross guys. They're just the guys who the Dukes of Hazard. They learned more about car safety in the Dukes of Hazard TV show than they did all of NASCAR. <laughs> like, jump this hill. Oh, oh, that guy broke his back. How are we gonna not do that next time? Oh, maybe put a sit on a donut. All right, how, oh, maybe a bigger donut. That guy broke his back too. All right, see, next guy. So the seventies, eighties guys are just getting. It was old cowboy way, right? And then they, the production figured out that they got to pay your medical expenses. It's all work with comp. So like, we'll give you a week to figure this out so no one breaks your back. Can you guys do that and do it safely in a week? And these cowboys were like, they drank for a week and then do it the next day. <laughs> like, <"No." laughs> uh, so it's, it's evolved now to where we have, like on Black Panther or Marvel movies or I didn't even call Salt with Angel and Jolie. We'll have three months of prep to break down the script, to train the actors, to go through, okay, this, I just worked on the new Superman movie down in Atlanta uh, for a couple of weeks. I kind of get my tone in it now. The, my, a lot of my buddies who I left with, they're, they're running, they're the bosses now. And I came up with them. Said, hey, you want to come golf for the weekend? I'll put you on contract and help me consult and point your fingers. So I did that and we had to break down these like 20 action scenes. And like, oh, here's the construction drawing of the building of Lex Luthor's office. And we take that out, you know, to scale in our warehouse and build walls with cardboard boxes. And what if spider Superman has to fly through around this wall here, put wires, and you have to rig this, and then he's gonna land and he gets blacked out that window. Okay, well, if you get the wires worked that way, okay, this wall has to move over a little bit. Okay, that window has to be higher. Uh, and we do it, we dial them in, we put them on wires, we hit a button, the compressed air, we shoot them until it works right in our cardboard world. Then we go back to the construction company and say, hey, here's a tweak you need to make when you build this set in real life. So that happens three months before we even get to the shoot. And then that time to a thousand, and every little time you see someone fly or, and then we work with the visual effects people and say, hey, we can't really do this practically. This is, and we can, but it's gonna take a lot of money and a lot of rigs. Uh, can you green screen this part and then pick it up over here? Uh, let me see. Let me kind of work with them and you know, trade off about, okay, make my job easier, make your job easier. If I can land him over here, does that help you? And then that's, you know, so there's a lot of work in the construction department with uh, visual effects or special effects. And it's very intricate to be safe when it shows up. And we test it, we try it, we do it, we do it. I did a, a stunt in the first Ant-Man where I get blasted through a window and we, it was at a practical house and it had a wire attached to my back. And there's a pool right here. I remember the movie, you fall out of a helicopter in a suitcase. I'm the bad guy, I jump out of the pool. And I'm looking for Ant-Man and he's small and they kick you through a window. I can't move up any further to get this angle down. And I can't back up anymore because I have to go five feet over this brick base uh, foundation of the, of the house. So uh, here to here is all we do. So this kept going up pressure until I can get over this concrete but not too high, we're hitting my head on the roots. And we did it and uh, with cardboard boxes so I can fit through this little hole. And on the day, they're like, all right, it's all real now. It's real glass, real house, real. And my butt skimmed over that concrete. If I was an inch lower, paralyzed. And they're like, we're going to do it again? And the director goes, hell no, I haven't done it in the first place. So like, we told you it was gnarly. <laughs> so there, there's a lot, of, a lot of prep. We probably made sure we were going to do that right for a month because there's so much physically at, at risk there. And the wire has to stay tight. If, like I hear three, two, one, go to hit a button and I kind of ride the wire. If I go a little early, there's a little slack on that wire, but um, you're done. If I go a little late, if I tow up, there's a very fine line of missing that one. So we practice and rehearse it, put the right guy in the right spot. And so there's a lot of entities like that that keep us safer. Um, and the visual effects, safer than the guys in the 80s who just go for it and you die getting this guy up. So we have the time and the money and the budget now to kind of dial stuff in and work really close with other departments, which is uh, probably a really long answer for that, but it's... <laughs> no, that, that was a perfect answer. Have you, have you had any, and it's, it's interesting because in my head, the actual stunt man, I would have assumed if somebody asked me like, Hey, what do you think? How do you think it plays out? I would have assumed 
all that was kind of done outside of you guys. And I'm sure there's consultants and other people that help like with the actual thing, but to hear that you guys are the ones actually testing it over and over is really fascinating and kind of even coming up with the idea of how to execute. I would have assumed that was like a, a team of safety and engineers that did all that. And then they just say, hey, all right, Bill, we're ready to have you in here. So yeah. I guess my next question, cause you kind of said like an inch away, you were an inch away from a tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. <laughs> maybe Oof, tragedy tra tra tragedy 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 or is it travesty tra is what you're trying to I, say i think i combined the two. i think, that's <laughs> I think you did yeah. um, uh, so yeah so, shakespeare over yeah, here look at that hey that's a new I, I'm, I'm claiming that as a new word uh, kevin did you have any moments that that kind of horror stories where things like like you just mentioned you were an inch away from being paralyzed in your career um, did you have any moments where, where things went wrong and any, any major injuries throughout your, I think you said 18 year career? I got pretty lucky. I, I thought I broke my femur on uh, a Transformers movie and I still have a hole in my leg, um, but it, it didn't break. Um, and that was, it was called a pickup shot. So there's a scene in Transformers Dark of the Moon where there's like robot snake is like uh, choking the building, the building's falling over. And we're in we're military guys in the building going through the glass. We slide down the outside of it. We roll roll for the building, and then people fall out of the building and they die. Well, Shia LaBeouf and the actress have to live, so they hold on to something and they live. But like, well, we can't have only them live. Let's have a couple of guys live too. But Kevin and Colin, you guys live too. All right, cool. So I don't have to fall. Turned out that was a horrible idea. Uh, so volunteer for that one because all the guys who died just fell on pads off camera. And then they do a pickup shot of the four guys who live, and they just literally off the side of the set, they built these like 15 foot walls, uh, like faux walls, or two by fours. And at this point in the movie, the building's like this. So the uh, the pillars are now horizontal on the ground. So we're, we just sit there with our guns and our gear, just straddling this little wall, and three, two, one, fall over, land on these pillars, and the ground made three feet below the pillars. But the pillar stops you from falling all the way through the ground. So hit the pillar and then don't fall off of it. So we see that you're alive, cut, go to the next shot. All right, first time we do it, I fell through the pillar like the boss would. So I just disappear in the pillar. And it didn't hurt or anything, but the camera saw me disappear. So in the movie, they think, you know, we have to see you or else we have to do it again. So, okay, we'll do it again, run back up. And they have this big dump truck throwing garbage over the top of us to make a, to match the movie, whatever. So an ass and a dump truck throws garbage and we just launch 15 feet to a wooden pillar, hope for the best. Uh, so I turned the other way this time and I launched myself out a little more. So I hit a different part of the pillar and there was just a two by four, just brace that all my weight on my leg hit that and it bounces me up and I black out. I come to and I realize if I fall off this pillar, I got to do it again. So I'm holding on, holding, waving my gun in the air, trying to prove to the camera that I'm not dead, thinking my femur's cracked in half, and I'm going to black out any minute. And um, it's lucky that I got the shot, but uh, that wasn't broken. But I was, it was pretty close to being just a random thing, pretty close to being, being out of commission for a while on that one. <laughs> what, what's your thoughts on, uh, I, it sounds like Tom Cruise, he likes to do like most of his own stunts. As, as kind of a stunt guy, do you guys kind of roll your eyes at that? Or or is it is there a legitimate level of respect of, okay, right on, like he wants to jump out of the plane or like, you know, drive that motorcycle off that cliff or whatever. Um, I just, I you know, of course, I don't know firsthand, but it sounds like he's one of those guys that seems to want to do more of that stuff. And from, i just curious, your, your perspective on it being an actual stunt guy. Yeah, for him in particular, we have a lot of respect for him because he puts a time and effort into the prep like we do. He comes every morning at 6 a.m. with the stunt team to figure out how to do this. He is passionate. He trains with them. I know a lot of guys that have worked in all the movies and the stunt double, and he's part of the crew. And he gets dirty with us, and we he figures out what he wants, and, and then he makes us do it. The thing that's a little, uh, is his stunt double will do it 100 times to make sure it's safe and comfortable for Tom to do and when Tom shows up, he's plugged in, and he, he freaking goes for it. He's I don't to the to his detriment. There were times where you know the story where they were on the top of the Khalifa building, uh, that one movie, and then he's so safe. Everyone who's around him makes everything safe around him. So he just goes for it. And he's he would have been a great stuntman, and he he's awesome in that aspect. But we're over the cowboy days. Like, calm down. Like the hook you in first, right on the top of this building. 
He just walks up, just walk around. Hey, guys, like, oh, Tom, stop. You're not safe right now. Like, clip in. <laughs> or uh, motorcycles right in. We'll go off a cliff. Yeah, go, go, go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't go yet. We have to, uh, so he goes for it almost like too much. But we have respect for him because he's in the room when we test it. and His ideas are there. He's passionate about it. And it treats us like gold. And then turns around and says, yeah, those guys behind the curtain, they don't exist. We're like, cool, thanks for all the money. We don't care. We don't want that anyway. So it's a little weird on that aspect, but we don't care. The other guys with bigger egos who are like, I'll do my own stunts. And they get hurt or they cost the stunt guy a job. The movie looks like crap. We put her name on So they wanted to do the fight scene. They punch like this or something. <laughs> um, they're like, I guess your movie, dude, but if you want to look good, you let me you know, throw the punch. Um, that's a little more annoying. We have, like I said, we have pretty good respect for Tom because he does get after it, but it's tested for months and months before he, he's, he's in there doing it. Yeah. I mean, you just mentioned there's some guys with the egos that want to do their own fight scenes. I can imagine you've seen the full gamut of Hollywood egos. So can you, <laughs> can you talk a little bit on that and kind of what are your, what are your thoughts on like the good, the bad, and then I'm sure the ugly as far as what, what the, what they, what do they appear like to the, yeah. to the outside person and who they actually are as a human? What I was going to ask is, are there any assholes oh. that, that, that the public thinks like just the coolest dude ever, but they're just complete assholes? Uh, if you're even willing to say that, I'm sure there's got to be a bunch. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. for sure there are. Um, <laughs> it's weird for us because we get the on the bridge version. Like, <clears throat> hey, you're, like, say it's like Chris Pratt, who's awesome. He's one of the guys. He's one of our buddies. He works as an athlete. He's great. So, Chris Pratt. You're going to come in, like he, he gets his schedule in the morning. Okay, you have two hours in the stunt team, you do a fight rehearsal, then you have a fit in, then you have an interview, whatever his schedule is. When he comes to the stunt warehouse, leave your entourage at the door, bring your workout gear, put your shoes on, get your mitts. We're going to work out and teach you shit. And if you don't want to, cool. Like, we don't care who you are. We're going to treat you to Angela and Jolie. Leave your entourage at the door, come in here with a different attitude. And they do. They, like, they kind of appreciate that. So we build a different relationship with them much before the movie starts and have the best version of them usually in a stunt heavy movie. And then they get on set, some of them are a little more, now there's entourage and the cameras are on and they're like, oh, they're kind of big time of people. They walk by us like, hey, Cam, how you doing? <laughs> and then like kind of like, they revert back to treating us like better because they know we don't really give a shit. So we could kind of get the best version of these people. The ones who are mostly the assholes are the mid-major people. Um, I did a movie called I Am Number Four. I played one of the aliens in it. And the lead actor that was just a dick the whole movie. He was cool, but too cool for school. And he was fine, but he was just really feeling himself the whole time. These are people who are like kind of famous, but not really. You really want to be famous. But with the movie, The Long the Show, Sandler's phenomenal. The director's phenomenal. Burt Reynolds, a 60 year of year review. I mean, there's no ego. It's that one guy was really trying to like, we were at dinner in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and there was Sandler, Burt Reynolds, a construction guy, a stunt guy, a PA, and all these booths having dinner. And Sandler had rented out the, the restaurant, and then at 8 o'clock it opens to the public, and we still hang out, and a lot of us started to leave or go to beer or whatever. And one guy had three bodyguards at his table like this. I'm like, Burt Reynolds is two feet from you having a beer with some random I'm like, who, who else? Come on, dude. Don't be a douche. Uh, <laughs> but years years later, I've heard he's now really cool. He's been humble. He's gone through it now. It's kind of his trajectory. So I give a little bit of grace on their journey because they're so protected. They're so shielded. You got agents and managers telling you're the best. You want uh, uh, RG to Robert Downey Jr. Uh, you have this whole camp um, base that you can fly your helicopter in the come whenever you want. And he, I'm like, dude, how? You, know, you got like a whole village over there. He goes, I do? Really? Where? I'm like, his agent got him. I didn't even know he was there. Like, because the agent is a piece of it. Like, he's like, oh, that wasn't an asshole. That guy asked for all this stuff. How does God even know it was there? Because their agent keeps up selling because they got more money out of it. So there's a little bit of a game there. So I to give a, little, a decent amount of, uh, of width to, to some people who are going over that journey and that crazy, crazy world. But there's definitely, you know, the who over what. People really, really love being famous. And, no, we don't really give a shit about that in our world. <laughs> yeah, it's really fascinating. Hollywood has such like an underbelly. So anytime I get a chance to talk to somebody yeah. who's, who's actually <laughs> in it, uh, I'm fascinated by it. And I'm kind of curious about the Superman now. Is that is that Superman movie going to be legit, you think? I mean, they failed how many times in a row with that damn movie. Um, 
they're doing the it's a remake they're going back to the root shot thing i was on there for a couple of weeks kind of consulting um so i didn't read the whole script but they're, they're going back to like the origin story i think which is always a good idea like batman begins and yeah i love character development and get me on the journey don't just throw people up there and throw explosions which dc tends to do yeah um so i hope it's good because the actors seem really nice and i like the guys who are in charge of the stunt department and, uh, but you know, I worked on some movies. I did. I love the first Zombie Land with Woody Harrelson. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great movie. <laughs> and I was able to work on the second one. I was one of the heads of the stunt department. I choreographed a lot of the fight scenes. I learned how to. We just from months we learned how to fun ways to kill zombies. We called our friends. Want to come and die as a zombie? We're like, yeah. We just invented ways to kill our friends. It was awesome. Well, this movie's coming great. Emma Stone was awesome. Woody Harrelson was so nice. It's just a fun movie. And I loved the first one that came out. I was like, eh. I kind of missed a little bit. I was, I was disappointed it wasn't as good as I thought it could be. So I feel like with Superman, they should follow the Batman model. Batman yeah. Begins, right? The, the origin story. So maybe they are doing Maybe that was the whole point because that was such a huge success. Uh, hopefully. That was Chris uh, Nolan. Chris Nolan goes, I'm doing my movie, Screen You, DC. And now all the producers are like, no, we want to do our movie. So if they hire Chris Nolan to do it, it'll be great. They hire some directors who have vision, it could be good. They're just going to copy and paste. No, who knows? Well, well, we'll be waiting. I know it gets to the <laughs> point where, the, at least on the Marvel side, they were just – they were killing it. It was just like win after win. But then, and I listened to like the, the wall street journal had a really good, like four part series on it where they talked about how they oversaturated the audience that you desensitized the, the, the fan and the customer, because when there's like a movie coming out every six weeks, it's less of a big deal to go see it. Whereas it's like when it's like One Avengers, yeah. like, and then to them, like it, it becomes a, a much more big moment. We've actually mirrored that with our marketing calendar with Born Primitive. We realized, all right, we're doing all these mini collections like every four weeks. It's it's making our big collections seem less cool because like it's, it, you know what I mean? It's not as a coveted thing. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had to reel that back. So I was always using the Marvel analogy in meetings. Tony's probably sick of hearing about it. <laughs> if we got we got to stop launching Marvel movies every two weeks. No one wants to see them. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, but I know, um, you know, obviously those guys get paid the big bucks to figure that out. But uh, that's just my two cents from, from the sideline. Well, it's hard from the Marvel aspect. They're printing money anyway. You do that, they're, they're gonna, you're going to make $100 million no matter how bad the movie is anyway. So it's hard to be like, no, let's not do this podcast. It's going to make a million dollars. <laughs> do another one. Yeah. Yeah. So they're guaranteeing to make that money. So it's a little harder to, to rationalize with those guys. Well, Kevin, this has been cool, man, giving us a peek behind the curtain. And, and it, I mean, it's, it's cool to obviously hear – your story is is a, is a bit different, like you said, Tony. Like you kind of experienced a lot of the stuff really early in your life that forced you to grow up quicker and, and you know adapt your perspective. That again, sometimes it takes getting punched in the face later on in your life uh, to you know to, to have to you know experience that perspective. And, and you were thrown to the wolves kind of right away, and and I think that served you well as a man. Um, you know, once you're able to get through that, so I think that was the coolest part for me to hear. But uh, love you being open about the, the Hollywood business. And I, and I think also you, you said something early in the beginning that resonated with me. You were willing to walk away from something that was super cool and super exciting that I'm sure as a young stunt man, you would have dreamed of doing right. If you could have looked in a crystal ball when it was day one of your career saying, all right, in 20, 18 years, you're going to be doing this. Um, you would have taken that deal, you know, a hundred times out of a hundred. So the fact that you had the maturity to step away from that, you know, even though that was like literally best case scenario playing out for you because you had a perspective of like, all right, I want to spend time with my family. Um, I know that for a lot of people, they, they wouldn't be able to kind of rip the bandaid off and make that decision. And I thought that, I mean, that's a testament to you as a man. And it's, it's one of those things you can't get over indexed on the things that don't actually matter in the end. You know what I mean? And, and then back to who you are, not what you are. Right. Um, because eventually those things are going to go away and then what's left well family will be one of those things so i thought that was really cool um perspective you shared there as well yeah thank you it was uh like i said i've been thrown into the wolves helped me like the best thing ever happened to me so i was pretty like you guys i'd probably be a huge asshole <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's it's crazy i mean kids like kids are freaking ruthless man and it's like oh, yeah. they're not they're they don't, they don't they're not mature enough yet at that age to realize like how big of a deal it is, you know, someone with like a cleft lip and like, you know what I mean? Like as an adult, you would of course never in a million years say something because you have the maturity to realize like that's, you know what I mean? Uh, but as like a sixth grade kid 
trying to boost your stock amongst your buddies you think it's cool to bully this kid so that's a that's a tough time man especially middle school with the with the hormones and middle school is already super awkward as middle it is. school's crazy you're starting to, you're starting to get hair on your armpits yeah you're starting to get like i think zits on your face yeah. your voice remember the voice cracking oh my god that was the, that was the biggest thing Dude. i remember i spoke in front of the auditorium and like i was all nervous and like the first word that came out it was the worst voice crack <laughs> ever and everyone's you know nudging each other, and, you know laughing it's like that was man sixth to eighth grade was freaking terrifying uh so the fact that you had to battle that with with other stuff going on just on top of that i can't imagine that but but cool how you how you pushed through it and then became a good athlete and you know the rest was history yeah i think uh, uh, also kids are resilient man i mean i went through a lot more than most kids do but a lot of people like soft parent nowadays i have three daughters and they're all tough as shit like it's tough love I, I i'm a little hard on them like in my hug but i can't believe you made your daughter uncomfortable like she kicked a cat like she got me uncomfortable like whatever she did you know um then i'm gonna give her a hug afterwards but they cry and they hurt, but that's how they toughen up. You have to have the right amount of trauma in your life to be able to be a, a well-rounded person. And I think that's something I'm trying to talk to without like giving them you know, doing my philosophy and stuff. Like, um, but yeah, kids are resilient. Like I went through that and it was better for it. You know, if you go through half of it, I think it's probably, if you're shielded from any of that, you're probably not going to be a great person at the end of the day. And that, I mean, one day you might get there, but you know. Yeah, it's where the the dose dose is everything. I think we talked we were talking about with Derek Wolf as far as like providing your kids kind of the the playground to to make mistakes and and for you to be giving harsh feedback at times like in little micro doses. That I think the thing you want to prevent is either that something that is so catastrophic like trauma wise that it literally almost like severs who they like their identity a little bit that's when you get like severe things downstream but couldn't agree more and i i have two with a third daughter on the way so i love hearing <laughs> you say that because it's something you question too as you're parenting like because it's a fine line man and you're always walking it of like how how hard can i be like and, and that and that i think if you're asking that question you're probably in a good spot already cuz you think of the ones that the ones that aren't don't ask that question are the ones that are are doing things that that could potentially leave downstream effects that like that kid's going to have to wrestle with but then once again there comes in the argument that even if you have those things happen to you that like <clears throat> you still if you're if you're willing to transcend out of being a victim of that you can come out on the other end probably more wise than an Im individual who doesn't so it's a, that's a that's that's a fascinating it's a, conversation it's impossible question, <laughs> I know. especially with girls oh, we all have girls right yeah and you know it's like a guy <laughs> yeah. raising a girl yeah like we're naturally softer man like yeah. it's just like you know what i mean it's like if i had a son i feel like it'd be really easy to discipline him because <laughs> he's he's one of like he's one of me right like i can yeah. that's you know we're men we got to be taught to it, yeah. you know a, you know a tough love but with a daughter man you know mine's three it's like Man, she's got me all figured out. But at some point, obviously, you got to set those boundaries for sure. Uh, yeah. That's a million dollar question. If you guys ever find the answer, let me know. I'd love to I'd love to have it. Yeah, sure. yeah. And they're all different. I have three of a seven year old, a six year old, and a four year old. My six year old, she's a little me. Like, I can treat her, I can you know, wrestle with her and everything. The seven year old is a little more emotional. So you have to, like, you know, pick and choose your target. You know? Yeah. Very cool. Well, well, Kevin, I know you're a busy man, so thanks so much for sharing an hour of your time with us and sharing your story. Um, and uh, good luck with everything. Good luck in the next chapter. Sounds like you're dipping your toe back in the water a little bit in the stunt game. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we appreciate your story. And um, let us know if, uh, if you ever need anything. you got an ally here at Born Primitive. Uh, absolutely. I appreciate it, guys. It was awesome.